So good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Finals Countdown. So we're into a new week actually here, uh, the last week of Finals Countdown actually. So we have a whole bunch of presentations that will be happening uh, this entire week. Um, yesterday we had to cancel some and postpone some due to yesterday's the next college day. Um, so a lot of our staff were not uh, actually working. So um, we did have two sessions yesterday, which we recorded and I'm actually uploading those to YouTube. Um, they're the first session with Roberta, so Math 100 Polynomials, that will be posted on YouTube shortly. And then my session at three o'clock, which was um, engage, not engaging, um, transitions for coherence. So those ones will be uploaded to YouTube by today, just, just so you guys know. <clears throat> and we're also streaming live on uh, Facebook. Uh, we usually get a couple of students watching there as well and uh, questions as well from Facebook. So I'll post those in the chat if there's any questions there as well. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to um, use the chat box or you know, however Leandra prefers uh, questions to be asked. Um, uh, she'll go ahead and let you know. But again, my name is Kwan Yazi, and I'm one of the professional writing tutors. So today we actually have uh, Leandra here who will be doing a presentation on Math 100, Radical Expressions and Equations, I believe. And she's one of the uh, professional tutors uh, here also with the Crown Point campus, actually. So I'll go ahead and hand it off to Leandra. You're on mute, Leandra. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, My name is Leandra Desperio Baya. I am the professional math tutor located at the Crown Point campus. Today, I have prepared a brief um, presentation regarding radical expressions and equations. So, um, as Quanta mentioned, if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop it into the chat box. I will be um, bringing up my presentation momentarily. It will consist of a PowerPoint. Um, there will be some example problems that we'll be working through. And if you guys have any questions, again, feel free to ask. So without um, further delay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Give me a moment here. Okay, can you guys give me a thumbs up if you guys can see the presentation? Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so radical expressions and equations is what we're gonna be um, covering today. For those of you who are, um, are familiar with the Net College, the textbooks, the information that I'm deriving is from the um, developmental mathematics textbook from Bittinger. So a lot of the content covered is what is referred to in chapter 14, which is where a lot of the students are, um, to my understanding, during this final weeks of the, the semester. So what I'm gonna be covering today briefly is the introduction to radical expressions. We're gonna discuss perfect square radicands. We're also gonna be performing operations, multiplying and simplifying, um, quotients, addition, subtraction, some other rules involving multiplication and then solving radical equations. So first, to get started, um, the introduction to radical expressions. When we, when an expression is written under a radical sign or the square root denoted by this symbol right here, we have what is known as a radical expression. The expression that is written underneath this symbol is called a radicand. So if we take a look down here briefly, to the square root of 49. Our radical is the bar that sits above 49. 49 would be termed as our radicand. And any 
any expression that we put under there, even in this situation, seven times seven, that's also defined as our radicand. So it's anything under this radical bar. A square root is defined as a number which produces a specified quantity when multiplied by itself. So when we're working with radical expressions, um, some of the things that we want to keep in mind is that we want to have a good understanding of exponential notation as well as factoring, because those two are going to be playing um, a big role as we're going through these um, problems. As you see here, the formula for square root is coined as c squared equals a, where c is any real number and the square root is its product. So c to the second power is the same as saying c times c equals a. So it's a number multiplied by itself. Um, in higher mathematics, the degree of this term can also go up to higher degrees, such as um, rather than squares, we can have cubes, so c to the third power. But for this presentation only, I'm going to go ahead and stick to the squares until we get more comfortable with it. Um, so let's continue from there. On this side, 7 to the second power is 49, which is just saying 7 times 7 is 49. So when we're deriving a square root, again, this is where factoring comes in. So we have exponential equations right here, and then we also have factoring. <clears throat> so the base of this, 7, is what we considered the square root of 49. Do you guys have any questions at this point? Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and move along. So for our radical expressions, again, they can take many different forms. Uh, typically, we might see something along the lines of, like our first example, we have the square root 49, which is seven times seven or seven squared. So our base is what's gonna be our square root equals seven. In other terms, we might see something like square root of 18, square root of x, square root of an expression such as x squared plus 4. Or we might even have a square root of a rational expression, x squared plus 3 over 5. As long as it is under the radical bar, it is something that we can um, solve. In this case, I'm just showing you the forms it could take, but we'll do more practice about how to um, multiply, simplify, and things of that nature as we go further. <clears throat> so perfect square radicands, you know, when we're in elementary school, we're taught um, our multiplication chart. Yeah. And we find that any Perfect squares are defined as any numbers that are multiplied by itself. So if we take a look here at the number and the square roots, um, on our number chart, we're used to seeing something like two to the second power is four, three to the second power is nine, oh, excuse me, is nine. 4 to the second power is 16, 5 to the second power is 25. And a lot of these are going to play a key role when we're doing our perfect squares. Because if we look at these, um, this chart right here, the numbers less than 10, um, 4 has a perfect square root because it has 2 times 2. So we get an integer on this side. 5. We leave this in radical form when we're taking our square root because if we were to try input this into a calculator or try to figure it out by um, formulas, 
we're going to end up with a decimal, which is one of the things that we don't want to deal with when we're dealing with um, factoring, multiplying, things of that nature. So we want to keep it in radical form for this activities. Down here, you see that the square root of 4, right here, the square root of 4 equals 2, and the square root of 9 equals 3 are perfect squares because their square roots are integers, meaning 2 and 3. Again, these ones are going to end up as decimals, the square root of 5, 6, 7, 8, so on. And then when we're dealing with variables, these can also have a perfect square root, meaning that down here, if we have an even exponent, you will have a perfect square. So if we look at these um, terms on the left, x to the second power, that has an even exponent. So that means that we can derive a perfect square root. This right here is termed as x times x. So it's a number times itself. Going down to x to the fourth, that is x squared times x squared, meaning it's a number multiplied by itself. So that's how we treat our variables when we're um, trying to find the square, a perfect square root six, it follows that same trend. However, when we come to exponents with odd, our variables with odd exponents, in order for us to simplify any of these expressions, we have to in turn factor our equations. So x to the first power, this is just saying that um, anything of this will be itself. So we're not going to make much of a difference for anything that has a degree of one. However, if we look at x to the third power, this essentially can become, we can factor it to be x squared times times x. So this one right here is this form up here. This one right here is this form right here. So what we can do is we can coin this factored um, variable with the even exponent. We can find a perfect square for that, which is x multiplied by square root of x because we can't simplify it any further, so we just carry that down. That is the term we get right here. And then we just follow, again, that same trend for anything with an even, or excuse me, with an odd exponent. For 5, square root of 2 will be right here if we factored it out. Square root of 5, or excuse me, the square root of x to the fifth power is the same as x to the fourth power times x, the square root of x. Looking at our chart up here, we see that the square root of 4, so we bring that down, x squared times the square root of x. And that will just keep going no matter the variable. If it's x that we're working with or y, a, b, c, a to z, we can use this to work through some of our problems. Does anybody have any questions about the perfect square radicands? Okay. If not, I'm going to go ahead and continue. All right. So multiplying and simplifying radical expressions. Because these are multiplication, you know, we're looking for factors and product. When we are given a term, we have a product rule for radicals, which means that if we're given two factors, 
square root of A times the square root of B. We can, because we're multiplying, we can place them under the same radical and perform our multiplication underneath, such as we see with this example right here. The square root of three times the square root of 11, we can put those two factors under the same radical and perform our multiplication to get 33, the square root of 33. <clears throat> and then if we're given a number and we're asked to simplify, what it's asking us to do is to factor a radical, in which case we can do this product rule in reverse. So we're given a number, we'd have 33, we can factor it out, square root of three times the square root of 11, or 11. And then we can go even further and separate those. So all we're doing is the reversal process for the product rule. So down here it says when we're simplifying a radical expression, we wanna first determine if the radicand Again, whatever's under the bar is a perfect square. If it's a perfect square, then we can remove the radical and we'll end up with a, a nice integer. However, if there's no perfect squares, then we can factor to see if, um, see if one of the factors is a perfect square. And I know that sounds a little bit confusing, but with a little bit of practice, I'll show you what that means. And finally, a square root radical expression is considered simplified when its radicand has no factors that are perfect squares. So this is a key factor here when we're simplifying. The radicand has no factors that are perfect squares. That means it is simplified. So I'm gonna bring up some practice examples in just a moment here, because along with the product rule, we're going to essentially, when we're multiplying with radicals, we are going to encounter some where we're going to have more than one term. So in the previous um, slide, we see here square root of three is a single term. Square root of 11, it's a single term. So we really don't, um, there, it's not too complicated to multiply those. However, going back or going forward again, when we have more than one term such as this, we're grouping these two and we're multiplying it by another term. It says we can use distributive laws and FOIL techniques. So this, these two laws go back several chapters to where we're talking about polynomials and factoring. Or, so in this case, when we're multiplying distributive laws, we have one term, we have two, three terms altogether. So whatever's within the parentheses is grouped together. So, and whatever's outside, we multiply by each term within the parentheses. So the first one, distributive law, we have the square root of three times the square root of 15. And then we also have the square root of three times the second term, the square root of two, which is how we ended up with the square root of 15 plus the square root of six. The FOIL method, this one is derived from FOIL, which is first, O, outer, I, inner, and L is last. So this one, one and four are our first terms. So when we multiply this, we get four. Outer is one and three, times three in the square root of five, which is how we got three square root of five positive. Then we go with the inner and last following that trend, we get negative four um, square root of two minus square root of 10. When we're doing these operations, what we're gonna find is that it's a little bit more difficult to come by like terms this is our entire um, result that is simplified because 
when we're dealing with um, polynomials with radicals, our we're going to kind of treat it like like terms, collecting like terms. So if there's nothing under, but it's coined as light radicals. So if these radicals aren't the same, then we can't simplify it any further. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and go into some practice problems. All right, so when we're dealing with multiplication, you now again, even if we have something like 5 over 11 times square root of 6 over 7, this is still one term. This is still another term. So when we're multiplying that, we can just push everything under the same radical. 5 over 11 times 6 over 7, in which case we get a radical of 30 over 77. And this is in its simplified form. Or if we're going to do the square root of x times the square root of x plus 1. Again, we can combine all these factors under the same radical. We have x times x plus 1. Now this one, again, it looks familiar to the distributive property. So that's how we are going to multiply. We're going to multiply x times x and x plus 1. We're going to keep our radical sign, and then we're going to perform our multiplication x times x becomes x squared, and x times a positive 1 becomes a plus x. So this right here is in its simplified form. We're not going to, again, like terms. This one's raised to the second power. This one, even though you can't see it, is understood to be raised to the first power. So because the exponents are not the same, we cannot combine these two, um, these two terms. There may come a time when we're simplifying, you know, again, with radicals, we can multiply or we can simplify. If we come across a term that is like this, radical of 18, off the back, we know that 18 is not a perfect square. But if we take the time to look at this number, the radicand, and see if it does have a factor of um, that is a perfect square, then what we can do is we can break 18 apart and then find um, perfect squares for any of its factors. So in this case, you know, 18, you have 1 times 18 as factors. 2 times 9, 3 times 6, and I believe that is all for this. So when we look at this, 1, 2, 3, they are not perfect squares. 18 is not a perfect square. However, 9 is, 6 is not. So if we're going to factor this, we're going to turn this into the square root of 9 times the square root of, right here, the other factor is 2. So when we come to the square root of 9, looking back at our chart, um, if you have one handy, you see that 3 is going to become our square root of 9. And because this is a multiplication, we're just going to join these two. 3 times the square root of 2. So this is the simplified version of the square root of 18. We do have to um, perform a little bit of work when we're simplifying, but it's nothing too extensive. On the other hand, we might get something like the square root of 48t. So 48, again, it's not a perfect square, but we can factor out any perfect squares it might have. In this case, we have the square root of 16 times 
the square root of 3. And t, because it's by itself, we can factor that out as well. So when we're looking at this, 16 is a perfect square root, so we can bring that down as 4. And on this side, 3 is not a perfect square root. We don't want a decimal, so we're going to leave that alone. T is raised to the first power, so we can't break that down any further, so we're going to leave it as such. And whatever's remaining, these two terms right here, 3 and T, we're just going to throw them back under the same radical again. So we have 4 the square root of 3T. So this is the simplified version of 48T. Does anybody have any questions? All right. And then, as I mentioned before, when we're doing multiplying and simplifying, we might come across, so this one's just simplifying, but if we were asked to multiply and simplify, we might end up with an expression like 2x to the third power times square root of 8x to the third power y to the fourth. We want to make sure whenever we're writing this out that we cover all the terms with our radical sign, just so that we know that everything beneath it is a radicand. So when we come to this, again, because we're multiplying, we can put all of this under the same radical. We'll end up with 2x to the third power times 8x to the third power and y to the fourth. And from here, we can do our multiplication. In this sense, because even though we have all these, we have a coefficient and variables behind it, this is still coined as one term. This is also coined as one term. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to combine our coefficients and our variables and multiply those together. And what I mean is, first, we're going to take a look at 2 and 8. We're going to combine that. 2 times 8. Then we have our x variables. So we have x to the third power times x to the third power. And then lastly, y, y to the fourth power. When we get that, we get the square root of 16, because 2 times 8 is 16. And again, exponential notation, when we're multiplying exponents, what we tend to do is, rather than say 3 times 3, what we're going to do is we're going to add. We're going to add 3 plus 3, so we're going to get x to the sixth power. And lastly, y, there's nothing to multiply it by, so we're just going to bring that down to y to the fourth power. So now we've combined our terms. And when we look at this, we see that 16 is a perfect square. We see that x has an even integer and we see or an even exponent, and we see that y also has an even exponent. So what this indicates to us, according to the previous slides of perfect squares, is that we can simplify this even further. The square root of 16 becomes 4. The square root of x to the 6, all we're going to do is take our exponent and divide it by 2. So x to the third power becomes our perfect square. And then y to the fourth, again, we're going to take 4 divided by 2. And y to the second power becomes our perfect square. So this is the simplified expression of these two factors. We took two factors, we combined it, and we sorted out whether or not it had a perfect square in it. Once we determined it, it did, we simplified it even further.
So that covers the gist of um, multiplying with radicals. The part that I'm going to go into now is quotients involving radical expressions. <clears throat> so when we're dealing with quotients, we do have a, a rule that we um, use, which is this. We have the square root of A over the square root of B. Like we did with multiplication, we can combine these two and put it under one radical so that it becomes easier to manage. To factor, we do, this, we do the reverse. We take anything under one radical and we separate them into smaller radicals, smaller radical forms. So some of the examples it says sometimes a rational expression can be simplified to one that has a perfect squared numerator or denominator. In the world of radicals, we love perfect square numbers, perfect square roots, whether it be in the denominator or the numerator, preferably in the denominator because a lot of times we don't wanna see um, a radical in our denominator. So one of the examples I'm gonna bring up here using this formula is if we were given the radical of the square root of 27 divided by the square root of three, we can combine those under the same radical for 27 divided by three which would become 27 divided by three is nine. So we'd end up with a radical nine. This right here is a perfect square root. See, when we had it alone, 27 was not a square root. Three was not a perfect square root. However, when we combined it, we did come out with a term that was, is a perfect square root. So the simplified version of square root of 27 divided by square root of three. Our answer is three. <clears throat> and so when we move on with that, you know, we might be given a different number. When we're doing the reverse, again, we're gonna factor. If we're given a term that is under two terms under a radical, 16 over nine. Using this principle, we can reverse it to break it into smaller. Because when we look at this 16 over nine, we can't really simplify that. There's no common, um, there are no common factors between 16 and nine. So if we can separate them and work them individually, square root of 16 over the square root of nine. We see that 16 is a perfect square and nine is a perfect square as well. So the perfect square of 16 becomes four and the perfect square of nine becomes three. So this again becomes helpful when we can't perform a simplified function when they're combined. Instead, we can separate them and figure them out separately. <clears throat> right. So for, there's not much to go on as far as quotients. Um, again, we might encounter situations where we don't have perfect squares, in which case we are gonna have to factor yet again. So if we were to end up with a number such as square root of 18 over 50, again, we know even if we separate these, these are not gonna be perfect squares. 18 is not a perfect square, 50 is not a perfect square. However, we can factor the numerator, 18, we know that 18 has a perfect square of nine when you multiply it by the square root of two. So nine times two equals 18, nine being a perfect square. 
50, on the other hand, has a factor of 25 times 2. We're going to add our square roots, our radicals. With this, we see, we notice two things. One, we have a perfect square in the numerator, one of the factors. We also have a perfect square in the denominator as a factor. Then if we look to the left, to the right side here, this square root of two over two, this looks similar to what we've been working with in polynomials where we multiply by one. Multiply by one, which usually takes the form of a number over itself. So in this case, because this number, the square root of two, is exactly the same as the square root of two, we can cancel these out because a number divided by itself is one. Anything times one is itself. So what we're gonna focus on primarily is our first terms. So we get the square root of nine over the square root of 25. And this becomes three over five. So that is how we can work expressions that do not have a perfect radical. We factor it until we find a perfect radical. If we can't find one, then it's considered simplified terms. All right. So then, <clears throat> now that we've understood multipli multiplying and um, quotients with radicals. Uh, we might start getting into more um, adding and subtracting with radicals. So when we're looking at this, we look at it and say, when we're adding or subtracting radicals, expressions can be simplified using distributive property laws and collecting like terms. So this kind of goes back to what I was talking about before. Like radicals, have the same radicands. So again, this goes hand in hand with collecting like terms, but instead of like terms, we have like radicals. So if we were to do a comparison between radical form and um, polynomial form, two square root of three plus three square root of three, if we were to use algebraic expression instead, we could do 2x plus 3x equals 5x. Using this concept of distributive property, see how similar they are? The only difference is that one of it has a radical and the other is just an algebraic expression. So this is going to come in handy when we're combining, um, combining expressions for addition or subtraction, is that if we have like radicals, square root of three and square root of three, we can combine those <clears throat> for five square root of three, just the same as we would with collecting like terms. All right, so in some cases, you might end up with, again, a rational expression under the radicand. So what this tells us is that it is useful to find an equivalent expression. So reach back in your mind, go back a couple chapters, and we find equivalent expression. This goes back into multiplying by one. Multiplying by one in the form of x over x, a number over itself. Anytime we multiply by one, we end up with an equivalent expression. And this will come in handy when we come to a process called rationalizing the denominator. And rationalizing the denominator is just a fancy way of saying we're going to remove the radicals from the denominator. For single terms, we'll use this um, multiplying by one. But if we have 
a denominator that is an expression like um, two plus five. In order to rationalize it, we're gonna use conjugates, which is keeping the same terms, but changing the sign in the middle. And we'll go into a little bit of practice about what those, um, about how to use those. And it says conjugates are a pair of binomials. There's two terms, binomial, with identical terms. In this case, two and two are identical. Square root of five, square root of five, those are identical terms, but share opposite operations in the middle. One's positive, one is negative. All right, so when I get into practicing these problems, um, if we're going to add, again, we love like terms. We love like radicands when we're doing addition or subtraction. We can end up with 3, three oh my goodness, okay, 3 square root of 2 plus 9 square root of 2. Distributive property says that because we have like terms, we can do 3 plus 9 times the square root of 2, which becomes 12 square root of 2. If we're subtracting 8 square root of 5 minus 3 square root of 5, we can put our coefficients together. 8 minus 3 times the square root of 5, and we get 5 square root of 5. So again, like radicands, they're our friends. We love them. It'll help us combine and simplify. But again, in, a perf in this real world, things aren't always in perfect squares or perfect like terms. So we're gonna end up with expressions that might be different. Say for instance, two square root of 10 minus seven square root of 40. So when we look at this, off the back, we can see we do not have like radicands. Most people throw in the towel and say, I can't factor that, or I can't simplify that. But in actuality, again, this is where factoring comes into play. If we look at the radicands for 10, the factors of 10, 1 and 10, 2 and 5, those are all prime numbers that don't have a perfect square, so 10 is its simplified form. However, if we look at 40, we notice that we can pull out a, um, a like term of square root of 10. And so first one, for the first term, we're just gonna bring it down as is two square root of 10 minus seven. And then when we look at our radical again, we can factor this. We can factor it into four times 10. So we have a radical of 10 here. We have a radical of 10 here. Our first um, factor, radical four, this is a perfect square root. So we can go even further to simplify that. The 10 minus seven times two, which is the square root of four, and square root of 10. Two square root of 10, and we have a negative seven times a positive two, so we get a negative 14. And then we just carry this down, square root of 10. So now we've manipulated the second term so that it has the same radicand as the first term. Now we have like radicands and we can proceed with two minus 14 radical 10 
our simplified version of these two terms becomes negative 12 radical 10. And this is considered simplified again because there are no, 10 is not a perfect square, nor does it have any factors that are perfect squares. So this is the simplified form of that number. <clears throat> if we get poly, um, algebraic expressions involved in the radicand, say the square root of 9x plus 9, again, we we'll make sure our sign covers all of our terms, minus square root of 4 x plus 4. Again, off the back, we know that these are not the same, but we can factor it to see if we can produce a like, a like radic radicand, excuse me. So using our principles that we've learned, we know that we can factor this out. In this case, because our coefficients, are, our numbers are the same, we can pull out a number. However, there's only one variable. There's no variable in the second one. So we're not gonna extract anything from there. So nine and nine, a common factor of that is nine. So whatever's left over from this term, we're gonna put in our parentheses. Nine, nine X, if we take out the nine, we're left with X. So nine times X equals nine X. Down here, 9 times what number equals positive 9? In this case, it's plus 1. Minus, and we have square root of 4. Again, these ones are similar, so we're going to take 4 out. And that leaves us with x plus 1. 4 times x is 4x. Four, 4 times 1 is 4. So now we factored our expression we have square root of nine times the square root of x plus one minus square root of four and square root of x plus one. We can simplify these to be three square root of x plus one minus two square root of x plus one. Now we have like radicands again. So we can do 3 minus 2 times x plus 1, which is 3 minus 2 is 1. Our simplified version is just going to be square root of x plus 1. So when we combine these two, this would be our answer down here, x square root of x plus 1. Kids have any questions? Okay. Let me bring back up my presentation here. Okay. And so for our last part, you know, we've worked through um, adding, subtracting with rationals. <clears throat> the last part that I want to get to in this, and I'm going to erase some of these numbers here, is that work through factoring, finding like radicands, The part that I do want to cover is rationalizing the denominator use, um, using conjugates. So, okay. So with that in mind, if we're given an expression, we're going to rationalize the denominator 
which basically means we're gonna remove any radicals from the denominator. So they gave us an example of three, two plus radical five. So rationalize the denominator, we wanna get this radical out. And what we do is we use our conjugate. Again, conjugate means we're gonna multiply by the same terms, but we're gonna change the sign in the middle. So we're gonna multiply by one. Two plus square root of five. We are gonna multiply by a factor of one. We're gonna multiply by the conjugate two minus square root of five two minus the square root of five. So we're using two concepts. One is the conjugate, the opposite sign in the middle, and then the property of one, we're multiplying a number times itself to get an equivalent expression. <clears throat> so the numerator becomes three times two minus square root of five over two plus five square root of five times two minus the square root of five. So if you see this, we do have what is called in polynomial terms, a difference of squares. When for this example, this be a plus b, square root of a plus the square root of b times the square root of a minus the square root of b becomes square root of a squared minus square root of b squared, which is a minus b. So when we look at this one, we see that our end term is gonna have a, which is two, and b, which is radical five, but because radicals um, squared are just equal to base number, b is gonna be a standalone number. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna multiply. Three times two is six. 3 times negative square root of 5 becomes negative 3 square root of 5 over, because we have 2 times 2, we're going to end up with square root of 2 squared minus square root of 5. Forgive me, this radical is not there because 2 is not a radical but we are gonna have a two squared. The radical is over the five, so we're gonna keep that. So when we get two to the second power, we get four minus this exponent out here and the radical, those cancel each other out and we're just gonna carry the five down. We get a negative one. So down here, we get four minus five, six minus three, square root of five over negative one becomes negative six plus three square root of five. So that is what rationalizing the denominator means. It means we're gonna be using this form right here, square root of a squared minus square root of b squared.
Okay. That one's rationalizing the denominator. And so before we get to um, solving radical expressions, do you guys have any questions? Okay. In that case, I just have one more as far as um, radical expressions go. So I'm going to erase these. And radical expressions, or ex excuse me, radical equations. Radical equations has variables in one or more radicands. To solve radical equations, we first convert them to equations without radicals by squaring both sides of the equation. So an example problem we have here is two square root of x plus two equals the square root of x plus 10. So in order to solve this, it tells us we must convert them to an equation without radicals by squaring both sides. So what we did here is we took the entire expression and we raised it to the second power on both sides. So when we raised it, we took we raised each um, factor of it. So two was raised to the second power because it's outside the radical. And then we also raised whatever was under the radical to the second power. Hence, we ended up with four parentheses x plus two and parentheses equals x plus 10. Once we've removed the radicals, we end up with an algebraic expression that we can solve. Over here, I'm just gonna carry this simplified version. Four x plus two equals 10 plus x plus 10. And what we do with this is first, we're gonna perform our multiplication to get rid of the parentheses. Four X plus eight equals X plus 10. And when we see the word solve, it means we're looking for a solution. In this case, we're trying to figure out what X is. In order for us to do that, we have to isolate X on one side of the equation. So in this case, I'm gonna, you know, I want it, I want my um, number to be positive. So rather than moving negative four or moving four to the other end by subtracting, I'm gonna move x to the left instead. So I have negative x, negative x. That cancels. So four minus one x equals three x plus eight equals ten. And then again, my primary goal is to get x by itself. So in order to do that, I'm going to get rid of any um, numbers that I don't need on this side of the equation. So I have 3x equals 2 because 3x implicates or implies multiplying. To undo that, we divide. And we end up with x equals 2 over 3. This is our solution to this problem. This is once the radicals have been removed, we can solve the polynomials remaining, which is exactly what we did here. Now, it's important to know that because of this radical expression, <clears throat> we always have to check our solutions because when we square something, we don't always end up with the number that we intend. Meaning that when we factor, say we had 49, right? The square root of 49 plus or minus seven. We end up with two solutions. So anytime we multiply a number, we get one answer, but if we factor it, 
using the square root method, we're going to end up with two solutions. So what that means is 7 times 7 equals 49, and negative 7 times negative 7 will also equal 49. So we got to make sure um, we know which um, solution to use to satisfy this equation. And again, I'll go into a little bit more practice with that on why we should be careful with checking our solutions. So if we were asked to solve this problem, x minus 5 equals square root of x plus 7. We only have a radical on one side. So in order for us to solve this equation, we do need to get rid of this radical. To do that, our first step is to square the problem on both sides of the equation. So we're going to do this. We're going to take this whole thing. We're going to square it. On this side, we're going to also square it. So this becomes x minus 5 times x minus 5 equals this exponent cancels out the radical, x plus 7. We just bring down whatever's in the radicand. So now, on this side, we're going to end up multiplying to get a, a polynomial, or trinomial, excuse me. So x times x, we're going to use FOIL method, becomes x squared, x times negative 5, negative 5x. Same here, negative 5x. And negative 5 times negative 5 equals a positive 25 equals x plus 7. Now we collect our like terms. x squared minus 10x plus 25 equals x plus 7. Now in order to solve this equation, rather than isolating the var x variable by itself because of the second power, what we end up doing is we end up setting this entire thing to zero. So in order for us to get zero on one side of the equation, we're just going to move these two terms to the left. So we're going to minus x, minus 7, minus x, minus 7 to both sides. Those cancel out and we end up with zero on one side. We have x squared, negative and negative. We end up with a negative 11x plus 18, because 25 minus 7 is 18. All right. So now, again, this becomes a, a polynomial that we're used to seeing. So to find the solution of this, um, of this caliber, what we end up doing is factoring. So factors of 18 that equal up to negative 11. We have 1 times 18, 2 times 9, 3 times 6. And when we add those, this one becomes 19, this one becomes 11, this one becomes 9. So we know we're going to use this, this pairing right here. We have x because this is negative negative 9 and x negative 2 equals 0. x becomes positive 9, x becomes positive 2. All right, so now we found two solutions after working through this entire problem. But the main reason why, again, it tells us that we have to double check our solutions is because <clears throat> um, anytime we square something, it might have a different um, base. Again, 49 can be the product of 7 times 7 or negative 7 times negative 7. So the way we're going to check this is we're going to input these variables that we've um, we're going to input these numbers that we've solved for into 
our original equation. So we have x minus 5 equals the square root of x plus 7. So if we were to enter 9 into the first one, we'd have 9 minus 5 equals the square root of 9 plus 7. 9 minus 5 is 4. Square root of 16, 4 equals 4. So this checks out. Now, if we were to try our second solution that we got, we have 2 minus 5 equals 2 plus 7. So we end up with 2 minus 5 is a negative 3 equals the square root of 9. Generally, when we're taking the square root, we take the principal square root, which is the positive number. So negative 3 equals 3, which is false. So this right here, only 9 is our true solution to this equation. Do you have any questions as of yet? All right. Oh, excuse me. And I just have one more thing to add as far as um, solving radical equations. And what this is, is, I'm going to erase all this, is that sometimes we're going to have to square more than once. So in order to do that, we might end up with square root of x minus 1. Notice that the radical only covers x equals the square root of x minus 5. This one, the radical extends all the way over the five. So again, what we wanna do is we wanna get rid of the um, radicals by squaring. What this turns into is radical x minus one, equal x minus one equals x minus five. And the radical cancels out the exponent. In this case, x, um, x squared minus square root of x times negative 1 is negative square root of x. Negative 1 times square root of x, again, is a negative square root of x. And one, negative 1 times negative 1 is a positive 1 equals x minus 5. So we end up with, because x is squared, the exponent cancels out the radical. So we have x. Right here we have like radicands. So we end up with negative 2x, negative 2 square root x, excuse me, plus 1 equals x minus 5. So at this point, right here again, we have <clears throat> we have a we still have a radical right here in the middle, but we want to set this to um, we want to get as rid we want to get rid of as many. Um, variables as we can. So in this case, we want to get rid of x on both sides. So then we end up with negative 2 square root of x. And then we can carry 1 to the other side, minus 1, minus 1, equals negative 6. So I'm going to restart this up here. We have a negative 2 square root of x equals a negative 6. So now what we can do is we can square this again 
or before we do that, we can actually get rid of this coefficient by dividing by negative two on both sides. So we have a square root of x equals positive three. So now we just wanna get rid of this by squaring it. Exponent cancels out the radical and we just drop whatever's in the radicand, x equals nine. So nine is the solution to this problem up here. Our original equation. So that's what it means when we have to square twice. We squared the original equation and then we squared once again once we've um, simplified to get our answer of nine. So as of now, that concludes my, <clears throat> that, ex that concludes my presentation on radicals. So I'm gonna go ahead and end screen share here. All right, so I'm gonna take a look here at some of the questions. Um, Monica, you mentioned radicands do not consist of ne negative numbers, right? All right, so in this, um, for this presentation, radicands do not consist of negative numbers. Um, off the back, we don't, because no number times itself is equal to a negative number. As we saw with the seven times seven, any number times itself will always produce a positive number. However, you know, as we go through mathematics into higher degrees of math, um, we're gonna learn about things called complex numbers, in which case I'm gonna bring up my whiteboard here. So again, we see that any number times itself two times two, negative two times negative two. They're always gonna produce positive numbers. There is no way for us to say um, two times two will ever equal negative four or negative two times negative two will never equal a negative four. But again, as we go in higher mathematics, we're gonna encounter um, what's called imaginary numbers, which is to say imaginary numbers is denoted by the letter I. And if we square negative, or if we square I, this becomes a negative one. So anytime we see, um, Complex numbers are usually A plus B I, where A is a real number, B is a real number that is not equal to zero, and I is this imaginary number. But for this um, complex numbers, I'll go a little bit more into that in my next presentation for Math 110 involving complex numbers. So Monica, I hope that did answer part of your question. All right, does anybody else have any questions? If not, I will go ahead and call it a day. I'm gonna hand it over to Quana and thank you all for having me. Awesome. Uh, thank you guys for joining us here with this session with Leandra. Thank you, Leandra, for that presentation. That was actually a really great presentation. So I hope you guys learned something from, or as a review basically, right? Um, to prepare yourself for finals. So uh, I believe tomorrow for Math 100, we have quadratic equations, which I will be doing for Math 100. And then right now, actually, we have Roberta, who is in Math 110, uh, going over functions and graphs. So if you want to hop on over to that session, you can, you know, just prepare for uh, if, you, if you're going to be taking Math 110 later on. But um, that's what we have currently that's going on. And then after those two, after the 11 o'clock when we have me at three o'clock, which is 
going over deconstructing the prompt in your writing courses. And that's basically it for today. And then we'll continue again tomorrow. So keep yourself updated with bclearningcenter.com. Everything is there. Um, don't forget to turn in your evaluations. That's how we're counting your participation points towards those gift card giveaways. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to email learningcenter uh, at thenetcollege.edu. Thank you guys for joining us here today.